situation may i request dr minat sundaram to take the floor please again here i would like to make an announcement i will mute all participants except dr minat sundaram we have nearly 63 participants now and i am getting a lot of background noise so this time what we will do is we will take the questions in the chat box in the chat box kindly uh, try to give your name first followed by your question we are having a lot of people logging in from mobile devices and these people i am able to see the mobile device name and not the doctor's name so kindly give your your name followed by your question and then at the end of the talk give us a few minutes where we can consolidate the question and ask please avoid asking the same question two three times because you you see the screen size is small and it will get lost in the number of messages it's a request sir dr minat sundaram please go ahead yes yes i get it i get it i'll have to unmute you yes i got it thank, thank you. you thank you thank you yes you you are unmuted sir oh, rahul you. has done it can you can you hear me okay thank you yes please good evening good evening thanks for the kind invitation two points first i'm very happy to be part of this first historic uh, webinar meeting that we are doing from podambaka mma as part of a cma meeting i'm very very happy to be part of it we've been doing webinars all through the week every day and this was really nice to be part of ima kodumbakam's first meeting ever number two i know i have given this talk on what i gave in the past in the ima and i thought that this is one problem that your patients are going to be calling you up for and if you want to i, I thought i'll just say these are my views how how i manage my patients so this is primarily like we can't have guidelines for these things so i'll primarily about how i will be managing my patient uh, if they call me up about what i do right i am a director and senior consultant in neurology at sims hospital now and uh, let me talk about vertigo diagnosis and management in the covid time just a brief recap this is not an anatomy talk just to tell you that the vestibular labyrinth is you know the sense of position of how we are where our head is how we are turning which way we are going all that is a complex interaction of just the visual inputs the vestibular inputs the proprioceptive inputs all these the brain then accumulates forms a complicated computation and then tells you this is what you are in three dimensional three dimensional orientation in the three semicircular can also this three levels like you know the mattam that uh, the masons would use they tell you how you are placed and then there are two autolithic organs utricle and saccule which tell you about linear acceleration you're driving in a lift and you're going straight up you're driving in a escalator you are not moving the escalator is moving the whole of you is moving that's what is called linear acceleration that is done by the utricle and saccule so these are important organs and this is just a recap on the kinocilia the stereocilia the hair cells on which they are and how the movement of this endolymph will uh, produce the stim uh, stimuli that reach the brain and tell you which way or which direction your head is moving so this is just about how there are two the paired semicircular canals the three sets and how we can tell you in the three different planes you know the coronal plane sagittal plane and all that so vertigo and dizziness you know there was a study that somebody did and they found that one in five adults we have been in the uh, the population now and asked how many of you had dizziness in the last month 20% is going to say yes i had dizziness the older you are more likely dizziness but you know is a very non specific term this is what patients are going to call us about they're going to call up and say sir re mai kamar sir there is some i feel gear i'm going to tell to that term so that is what they're going to tell us but this has different meanings you know just when somebody says dizzy first of all we need to know what exactly you know somebody who has an anemia and feel tired will say sir it's like enak thala sutra mari somebody who is depressed going to say nadanda i am feeling like i am dizzy pre sinko somebody who is anxious who is really unsteady suppose there is a stroke and becomes unsteady he is also going to say i am dizzy so when you say dizziness we are going to talk about one is the sensation of motion everything seems moving it is seen to be moving or perceived to be moving either you see it or you feel that you are moving that is when it is called vertigo 
So when you say vertigo, it is a specific term for a specific feeling. I'm going to come to the explanation again. But just to tell you that this is an illusion. What is happening is this is a brain. Why is it an illusion? Because nothing is moving. You see things moving when they are not. The brain senses them as illusion, as a, as a, as a movement, as a rotational movement. And, but nothing is moving. So it's an illusion, basically. That's what we mean. But it can be due to peripheral problems or central problems being in the central nervous system. But then the feeling of people feeling lightheaded. I stand up, I feel lightheaded, I'm about to fall. That is a pre synco which is before a syncope. Somebody falls down unconscious, it becomes syncope. Then there is disequilibrium. So that happens with ataxias, for example. Somebody who is drunk, he is, he has disequilibrium. That is different from vertigo. Here it is reeling. He just goes this way, that way. That is neurological disorders. You have, can have it in cerebellar disorders. You can have it in Parkinsonism. You can have it with drug intoxication, for example, ethanol, methanol, or sometimes even positive perceptions. But then there is that ill-defined giddiness. You know, this gar. I don't know where this word came from. It's a million dollar question for me still. But then, the ill defined giddiness, which is not vertigo, which is not synchro, and which is not disequilibrium. But there is something that's uneasy. As I usually write dizziness within inert but commas, and patient says such findings, which means that this can be due to a lot of things, but the majority are going to be psychologically based. That is, they're going to have anxiety, stress, very common in the IT population, hysterical problems, affective disorders, etc. So the symptoms encompassed by the term dizziness are all these. When the patient says, I'm dizzy, know that it can be vertigo, it can be uncertainness, it can be imbalance, it can be spinning, it can be a floating feeling, fainting, lightheaded, swaying, twisting, blurred vision. Somebody, a patient came to me and said, I have giddiness. And lo and behold, examine the patient, the patient has a sixth nerve palsy. As the wire saying giddiness, he says, when I see something, I see two objects, I become disoriented. That's also dizziness for some people. So when they say dizzy, we don't have to rush off writing tab tablets for them thinking that this is what I So we need to move out that there can be a lot of reasons for the term dizziness. It can actually be explained by a lot of symptoms. So the present thing symptom is very important. If you have vertigo, you know the vestibular apparatus is abnormal. It can be peripheral, it can be central. Simple. There's a disequilibrium, somebody has unsteadiness. Then it can be due to vestibular problems. It can also be due to spinal causes. We have a posterior column, let us say, you can still feel unsteady. Rocking or swaying, all this terminology, maldi debarkma. It's a very fancy name, very, very stylish looking name. Nothing but somebody who is disembarked from a ship and if he's traveling, if you've been traveling in a train for two days and then you get down and you're going on the road, you drive, you stop at a signal, you still, when you stop at a signal is when you start having this dizziness. But when you're driving, you're all right. This is called maldi debar. Then there is motion sickness. Swimming or floating can be psychogenic, but when you have bilateral, you know, when you have a problem in one ear, what causes the symptom of vertigo is the normal ear. Just remember this point because important in treatment. When you treat, when you give all these vestibular suppressants, you are suppressing the normal ear. You are not treating the disease here. And we need to always remember this. Because if you suppress a normal ear for long, you can produce bilateral hypofunction. Both sides become hypofunctional. They will not get vertigo. They will only feel like walking on the moon. It's called uh, walking on moon uh, sort of feeling. And that's when they feel like they're floating, like Neil Armstrong. Oscillopsia is when you see everything going up and down. And that is an accompaniment of nystagmus. So somebody says, I have oscillopsia in these times. You know they're going to have nystagmus. You don't even know how to go near the patient. So this is the international consensus. This is in summary of what we have said. Basically about the common vestibular symptoms the patients would complain of is vertigo itself, dizziness, because there is an impaired spatial orientation without a false or distorted sense of motion, Unsteadiness, oscillopsia, pre syncope or syncope. So, vertigo, just to reiterate, is an illusion of motion, implying a disorder of the vestibular system, either peripheral or central. So, an illusion of motion. That's what is important in vertigo. The differential diagnosis, between central causes, peripheral causes. 
the peripheral cause, the most common cause is BPPV. It is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. The name is, but it's not basically very benign, but it has been given the term benign. It's not 100% benign, but there is paroxysmal. It occurs in episodes. If there is a history of the uh, past, the patient has had this episode two, uh, the last two, two, three days, it became all right one year ago, six months ago, three years ago even, then and if it is, comes on when the patient is lying down, is getting up, when he's turning to one side, in bed most of the time, or getting up from bed, it depends on which semicircular canal is affected. So that is where BPPV would be diagnosed. So this is positional. While walking, they don't have a problem. They just feel unsteady. They don't see things rotating. As for that history, what precipitates it? Does walking cause the problem? Does lying down is a problem? They say, okay, I'm, I'm still able to go to the toilet, come back, do my activities. Then you're probably dealing with only a positional vertigo. Labyrinthitis, well, if there is an ear discharge, you'll make that. Vestibular neuronitis is long drawn. We'll come to that in the uh, duration part. Meniasis is when, you, when a patient has dizziness, that is vertigo, associated with tinnitus, and always some degree of hearing loss. There is always some degree of hearing loss. And this is the characteristic of meniasis. Uh, so this occurs in episodes which last more than 20 minutes at least. It's not something that goes in, you know, a BPPV, that vertigo, they say that I get up from bed, everything rotates classically about 30 to 40 seconds. That's all it does. But when I say when it goes on for more than 20 minutes, patient keeps puking and continues to vertigo, you're dealing with meniasis. We'll come to the duration, because it's very important. In history during these times, very important. So in the history, what all should we be asking? Is this first a true vertigo? Do you have vomiting? Do you have uh, an increased sweating? Do you feel like going to the toilet? How did it start? How long did it last? Very, very important. What precipitated it? How long did it last? Did you have auditory disturbance? Do you have, at that time, a fullness in the ear or loss of hearing at that time? Very important question to ask. Do you have the neurologic disturbances? We say that Ds. You see double diplopia, dysarthria, difficulty in speaking, difficulty in swallowing, dysphagia, common things. Do you feel numbness in the hands? Do you feel one arm has become weak? Do you have difficulty in reaching out for objects? You are a little unsteady and your hands shake. And those are probably neurologic disturbances. Tell you this is probably a stroke. So was there a loss of consciousness to start with? And do you feel anything unusual? If you see, you see the oscillopsy, as I said. Any past or, uh, head or neck trauma, a recent head trauma is a common reason for BPP because when they hit the head trauma, they hit their head against something, fall down in the bathroom, get up, they're all right. Next day, they have vertigo. It's because of the autoconia inside, they are dislodged by an impact. So that's why if they have a history of head trauma, they probably a BPPV brought on by it. Past medical history, you ask about whether the patient has cardiac problems, has he been on drugs, has he recently started taking drugs like aspirin, all those things would be important. So previous symptoms, or has, be, has he taken any over the counter medications? What about drug and alcohol intake? You must always ask. So the presentations, very simple. So how would the patient present? If present? it is a sudden onset, acute onset, but prolonged, spontaneously occurring, no positional change, nothing. Just has come on suddenly, then you're probably dealing with either a stroke or a vestibular neuronitis or a labyrinthitis. A vestibular neuronitis but labyrinthitis is an interchangeable term. But a stroke or a vestibular neuronitis is what comes on suddenly. So such a patient who says, I just started having this and then it is continued. Then you're probably dealing with the stroke. Rest, send that patient straight to a hospital. Ready for stroke. Today we're talking about thrombolysis. That is the base of another talk. We'll do it some other day. But then the patient says, I have recurrent episodes. Spontaneously occurring dizziness. No position change, nothing. It just comes on suddenly and I have vertigo. I feel a re-unsteady subjective or objective vertigo. Then you're probably dealing with genius, ask about hearing loss, you're dealing with vestibular migraine, ask about history of migraine in the past. It is important for the diagnosis. Many people, when they cross 50 years, they become older, they may have no more headaches during these attacks, but they would have history of migraine in the past. So if it's just classically, as we say, these symptoms generally in migraine, we would say it would, by criteria, last from four hours to 72 hours. So four hours to three days. So that's what, so anything that occurs less than half an hour or something, a headache or like that. Or vestibular symptom that lasts lesser. Uh, vestibular symptoms can be milder, can be subjective, can be objective, can be just a tinnitus, can be, can even be positional. Anything can happen. 
with mesophilum migraine, but then you should have the classic history of migraine to take. Or it could be psychogenic. You can have recurrent attacks of TAS, but an isolated vertigo is not, is, is probably an unusual, very unusual cause. It can very, very rarely present that way. A posterior circulation ischemia, it's not a common presentation. So it's not like vertebrobasilar insufficiency. The terminology is defunct, doesn't convey anything, and should not be used. If somebody has recurrent positional vertigo, straightforward. This is BPPV. You don't have to worry. If you are very good, you can even have, you know, if there's a doctor on the other side, you can even do a Dick Salpike on a WhatsApp call. I've done it. And you can even do repositioning maneuvers on a WhatsApp call. I've done it on patients who are doctors who have had acute uh, attacks of BPPV. One friend of mine was traveling abroad and called me over the phone. And I did it on him and he became all right. Repositioning done while he was abroad or over the phone. So you can do it, but you don't need all that. This is generally a disease that comes on only in lying down, right side, left side, whatever. So I'll tell you what we can do with it. So if it is a chronic dizziness imbalance, you're probably dealing with degenerative diseases like Parkinson's, but this is not an acute problem and it not be too much of a worry now in COVID times. You can tell them that, okay, we'll see. Right now you be careful, don't fall down. As you've seen, maybe when the situation normalizes. So the points note in history, patients frequently saying the report of the type of dizziness. Within minutes, they even, they're not sure. They can, they're so afraid that they won't be able to tell you what they really feel. So they can keep changing. The emphasis should be on how long is it? What started? These two questions are very important. They can give you the diagnosis. Even otherwise, even non-COVID time, these are the two important questions to ask in Vertigo. They will tell you that this is the diagnosis. It's very, very, very important. So it's called the timing and triggers approach. So you either have an acute vestibular syndrome like I said about acute, occurs spontaneously and is prolonged, continues for a day. Hopefully they come to you immediately rather than a day because immediately means we can do something about it. There are thrombolytic and other therapies now available. Episodic positional, we're talking about BPPV. Episodic but spontaneous, we're talking about migraine, menias, probable TAA. Chronic unsteadiness, not the concern right now. We can evaluate the patient in detail. So when we ask the history, how long is the duration? This is what it is. The patient says it's momentary. So it's just a, a severe, if you have a severe unilateral vestibular failure, you can have momentary dizziness. That can happen. What if it's seconds? I said 5 to 20 seconds it can happen. As I said, very commonly it's about 30 to 40 seconds. Rarely only above a minute's time. So with the numerous VNGs, I can tell you from experience that it is usually about 30 to 40 seconds. Rarely crosses one minute. If it's minutes, the two to 20 minutes in TA posterior circulation, peril fistula, it's hours, uh, more than two 20 minutes, but uh, more than 20 minutes, less than 12 hours, you're dealing with menias, we are dealing with rarely peril fistula and other reasons, but it is unlikely. If it is days, then you are dealing with CNS lesions, vestibular neuronitis. I'm not ruling this out in our patients. They have tried medications at home, tried all this, little juices, kashayams, everything, and still continue to throw up and feel uh, vertigo. They may call you on the third day or fourth day. Beware that you're probably dealing with CNS uh, lesions like a tumor or a stroke or if it is acute with a stroke. Or if it is a vesicular neuronitis, needs immediate treatment. So these things you must refer to the hospital. So be, beware of these things. Very important in history. This is not practical now, so we will not talk about it. I'm not doing that. But you know, this is again, you know, peripheral or central, you can go by history. Peripheral has more symptoms. Central and it is paroxysmal, right? So somebody says, I have severe vertigo and I start throwing up my world, this and then all that, they're probably peripheral. It can occur in central, but probably peripheral. But the symptom, the pattern is constant in a central vertigo. You're only concerned that may missing a stroke. So that's why I'm putting this point here. And if it is unilateral in peripheral, it can be unilateral or bilateral, the vertigo itself, you know, any, any distance, it doesn't change with sites. And then if there are associated symptoms, if there are auditory symptoms, then it occurs in peripheral more commonly if it's a tinnitus happening. It is more, it is peripheral. But if it is a central cause, you can have deafness. So let us be careful about that. I'm just going to give you some case scenarios, simple things, just a history, and then we'll talk about the diet. So 35-year-old female comes with sudden onset spinning of the room. 
when she rolled over in bed this morning to get up it lasted about 20 to 30 seconds it was associated with profound sweating and she vomited twice there is no tinnitus diagnosis by now you'd all made it it is bpp so simple so over the phone patient comes out of the history you ask about the positioning you ask them about the real spinning not the little pushing they might feel while walking the real spinning then you have the diagnosis 45 year old male software engineer feels subject to pushing when standing. He stands like that, he feels a little pushing, especially when turning. And, he might, and feels he might fall, but he has never fallen. He has been going to work, he is at home, he is doing all his uh, work at home things. He is going to the toilet, he is going to bath, he is having food normally, but he is subject to pushing, especially when he turns suddenly. He has a little push, but he has never fallen. He hasn't had to support much. Occasionally he might need a support. This is classically anxiety by stress induced. Don't be surprised if this increases over the next couple of days or over the till the lockdown. It is definitely incredible. I've had a lot of calls from patients. So this is going to be on the high. The problem with this is eliciting the history on a video call. Sometimes you may have to ask patients to mimic what they have and you would definitely get the diagnosis. So the diagnostic algorithm would be like patient presence of dizziness Find out what sensation. If it is vertical, we'll go to the left corner. We we'll leave our disequilibrium precinct of light or redness. If it is vertical, ask about migraine symptoms. They're probably dealing with migraine. There is a hearing loss. Yes, along with the episodic vertigo, then you're talking about meniere's and labyrinthitis. Uh, no episodic vertigo and labyrinthitis, but with the episodic vertigo and meniere's. If it is the, there is no hearing loss, patient has an episodic vertigo. Then it is BPPV, but no hearing loss, but it is continuous. You're probably dealing with this. This, these are the common things that you will come into and practice. Others are all pretty rare. One more patient, two more patients rather. 60 year old man, sudden onset, objective, one subjective spinning of everything, reels to one side. He can't even sit, associated with vomiting, has hiccups here. Please note this difficulty in swallowing. The minute somebody says hiccups, difficulty in swallowing. It is a brainstem involvement. You're probably dealing with a lateral medullary syndrome. You just ask the patient to rush to the hospital immediately, whatever the setting. So this is important to ask. Central, this is probably Valentine's. In a 54-year-old female, there's a sudden onset unsteadiness. Has lost hearing also suddenly on one side. Look at the other thing. She has double vision on the right side. There's deviated angle of uh, on the left side. So she has all those problems. There is the left side, she has facial weakness, obviously. She has developed some facial weakness. She has she is double. So there is some degree of ocular motor disturbance. There is loss of hearing. They said loss of hearing is more likely peripheral. But here with this setting, there is unsteadiness also. You're going to be dealing with the stroke. And this is actually characteristic of Nyka syndrome. This is a type of stroke. The previous one was posterior inferior cerebellar artery. This one is anterior inferior cerebellar artery. And these people are C double, they are deaf, they are dizzy, and they have a deviated face. The syndrome of these. So when a stroke or TAA more likely? This is what will be very concerned. I will be very concerned about it. I am called for to rule out such things. The one thing, this is an acute onset thing. They get up in the morning or it suddenly as they're sitting, they develop sudden onset vertigo imbalance. Very, 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 very good point. The next one. Patient cannot walk anymore, even with help. The peripheral vertigo, see the BPP weight told you they walk around. Anxiety induced, they walk around. Many years they will be very unsteady. They will feel dizzy, but they can still walk with help. Even with help, these patients, if they find it difficult to walk, beware of that patient, probably dealing with a stroke. There's an acute onset hearing loss associated with other findings. Be careful. If there's a new or unusual headache along with it, then be careful. If there is a patient who is elderly, elderly, who has had a cardiac problem, has diabetes, who has hypertension, who is smoking, then be careful. If there are other central signs, patient says, I have weakness in the legs, I have numbness here and there, then you start thinking. Examination part will leave alone. So this is again just to reiterate the diagnosis. So trigger, ask about head movement, ask about one particular position, ask about pressure. You know, suddenly they close their ears and then the vertigo goes up, you're probably dealing with the peripheral one, the perilim fistula, the superior semicircular canal, the all this can happen. If sound increases vertigo, sudden sound and then feels the vertigo, then they're probably dealing with, this is a specific, it's called Tullius phenomenon. And it occurs with 
superior semicircular canal dehiscence. So it is important, but right now you can't do anything about it. Let them relax. We can do something about it. If one's training at stools, they develop again. It could be one of the canal dehiscence, or it could also occur in a chair malformation. So this is a chart which puts together all those things. But just remember, see the part that I have marked in red. Remember that these are the ones that you will be most importantly ruling out, even though the commonest one is BPPV. So post admission TAA lasts minutes, vestibular migraine lasts hours, while it's an acute onset spontaneous vertigo, which lasts for days, up to days. You don't have to wait for days, but severe vestibular neuron. So these are the ones you primarily ruling out. And the other ones are all peripheral and can be managed unless the patient has an acute ear pain and starts having ooze from the ear, then the ENT has to be involved immediately. So management, last two slides, I'm almost done. So to start with in this setting, always fast for history of fever, cough or travel. You know, we are dealing with a disease that the whole world knows only for four months time. And we do not know the all the manifestations of this disease. You don't know. There are reports of patients who are presented with stroke. This is a patient who are presented with hemorrhage. Reports of patients who are presented with epilepsy. Reports of patients who are just presented with cranial nerve palsies. So, or just loss of smell. So be careful about this. Always ask for history of fever, cough, or travel, or, or coming in touch with anyone who has traveled. This is important to ask. Please make this sure uh, in the history. If you don't have to touch the patient, the patient comes to your clinic, make sure you check the if, uh, look for fever and all. If there are red flags in the history for vertigo, like we said, over the phone, you see the patient, you can make the patient sit at even two meter distance and ask all these questions. Refer immediately to a sorry, a care. The patient is to be brought into a room or made into a sit there, two meters away, one meter away, whatever. You, uh, but you see the patient can't even sit, face to one side, has to be held. This is not your patient, this is probably something that needs to go to the hospital. If there are no red flags, patient is ambulant, comes in and says, then there's no harm. If it is over the phone even, we can prescribe beta histamine 24 milligram BAD for a week to 10 days. This is not guideline. No, I can't talk about guideline because nobody has guideline for COVID management in, uh, in during COVID time management of any neurological thing. You can only suggest. Nobody is a pundit. Nobody has acquired that much knowledge in the world, throughout the world. So let's go with common sense. So give beta histamine for 10 days and come for a review as soon as the situation normal. This is what I would tell my patient. Ask the patient to sleep on the comfortable side. If he says, I have a problem on right, lying down on the right side, say you go to the left side and sleep till the next 10 days. Try not to turn. Maybe three, four days if he turns inadvertently, you'll find he has no vertigo. If headache is present, it's not an acute onset headache. It is. It looks like a migraine. He has had headaches in the past too, but has never took treatment for it. So Non-asthmatic, no cardiac failure. You can start on a low dose propranolol and suggest that the patient take a combination of naproxen sodium and domperidone. Uh, the for now, SOS. So start this alone. Let us not start any other fancy drug. If you're fluent with repositioning maneuvers, it can be done over the phone, and it can be definitely be done, especially if on the other side you have a doctor, a doctor relative, or whoever. If you have the patient says I have severe vertigo and I need relief, like you're dealing with the menias or whatever. On history, you think like that. Then you're going to prescribe drugs like Cinerazine, which is Stugeron, Procloprazine, which is Stematil, and combinations that are combinations like Dizitac and all that. Please do not prescribe them for more than three days at a time, especially in the elder. I've seen so many patients with Parkinsonism. After this, that have an undiskinesias, oromandibular especially. Please be careful about it. And it is always good to write, not seeing the patient in person. On top, if you're writing or typing a prescription for the patient, please make a note of that. You never know. You never know what is lying well. If anything more, you're welcome to call me anytime for a clarification. My mobile number is on the screen. You, you are welcome to call me. I'll always be happy to help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Minat Sundra, for the talk. We have a couple of questions from the members. Yes. Dr. Umapati has asked, Sir, if I am rocking and swaying movement occurs occasionally on and off, what will be the reason? Okay, if it is just rocking and swaying movement, then it is, you need to be 
uh, first thing is I would like to see what the movement is. But if it's just rocking and swaying, this is a feeling of mild disequilibrium, and this is very likely to be stress related. That's what I would first. If you ask me about priority, that is where I would put it. If it is on and off, especially. A uh, question from Dr. S S K Sandeep: What is the, any known CNS manifestation of corona? There are. There are definitely CNS manifestations described. No neurological manifestations of corona have been described. One of the commonest ones, which was described in a lot of patients from Korea to Italy to Spain, and there are papers already out. People have done autopsy even. Is that corona can be present in the brain and the loss of smell is one of the earliest ones that happens in many patients. What else can happen? Well, as I said, strokes can happen. There is an increased uh possibility of stroke these are probably because of the pro coagulant activity that happens we had uh, talk about anti coagulants too it has been noticed that strokes can happen even though as i talk to specialists across india there hasn't been a real increase in stroke in india so across the stroke units in india but still there are, uh, i was talking to someone in all in the institute they said there are three patients with intracerebral hemorrhage as presentation and then they found those patients to be covid positive so we don't know. We still are evolving. Yes, there are a lot of manifestations. Guillain-Barre syndrome has been reported. Epilepsy has been reported. Previous corona, the previous coronaviruses, which caused the previous ones, have been demonstrated in the brain. And there is a thinking that because there is anosmia, that it is probably affecting the olfactory nerve, and we as uh, neurologists are dreading that this should not lead on to a later extrapyramidal syndrome. Yeah, there is a question from iPhone. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who the doctor iPhone is. What is the relationship between chronic cough and vertigo? Okay, the, the, the chronic cough and vertigo by itself doesn't suggest a diagnosis. But if you have chronic cough, you can strain and go on to a vascular cough. So just be aware, if you have a chronic cough or you have a bout of cough, like uh, that occurs in whooping cough in children, for example. You continue to cough, you strain too much, and suddenly someone has a vertigo. Be very careful about looking at the vertebral arteries in a patient like that. But as such as chronic cough and vertigo, there is no direct correlation that I can think of. Question from Dr. V. S. Tirunavakaras. Can eustachian tube block cause vertigo? How to proceed? Okay, if you station to block, generally causes the block feeling in the ears. And if it does affect the inner ear, because the eustachian tube is connected to the middle ear. And if it does affect the inner ear, if that is affected, you can have subjective vertigo. I think it has to be primarily an ENT management. I think they should be the best people to handle. I, I for myself, a patient comes to me before I send them to the ENT surgeon, which I always do. If I suspect it's an eustachian tube block, uh, then I would probably ask them to do some Steam inhalation, other stuff, decongestants, maybe, and ask them to go on CD. Dr. Satish Rao, what is the role of Jinko biloba? Okay, Jinko biloba uh, ginseng uh, has been found to be useful in some forms of dizziness and vertigo. There are no hardcore class one studies that can say that, yes, you should use Jinko biloba. You, if you ask me, do I do? Yes, it's chronic forms of dizziness I do use, but there are no hardcore evidence for it. Dr. Vamsi Krishna, what is the best treatment for migraine and for how many days? Wonderful question. Uh, but you know, we're talking about vestibular migraine in this context, but as a general rule, uh, Dr. Vamsi, what we would uh, think of is primarily the age of the patient and the build of the patient. Now, if you have an obese patient, for example, why I'm saying this, even asthmatic, you can't use propranolol. Patient has a history of depression, you cannot use uh, Sibelium. Uh, so, you have to be careful about what drug you're using in which patient. Flunarazin, sorry about telling the trade name. So, Flunarazin, you can't use in a patient who has a history of depression because 15% go into depression. If patient is obese, don't give divalproates. If patient is already lean, as a history of renal stones, go and give topiramate. But all these four drugs are very, very useful. I mean, yes, don't give, but don't give it in the elderly. Don't give it in patients who have already have problems in passing urine, prostate enlargement, because it's anticholinergic effect. 
So these are all the drugs that are primarily used in prophylaxis. So that's prophylactic treatment is talked about in different doses. Then there is abortive treatment. The best abortive treatment are the triptons. But to my own knowledge and to my own experience, 25 years and counting, I rarely use triptons. And I found that most patients would respond to a proper prophylaxis and the usage of uh, paracetamol or naproxen in proper doses taken within the time. You know, it's only when the strain gets so severe that it doesn't respond to anything. So the best treatment, how long is the question that many people ask. The general rule be again that it's a lightly gray area. The minimum time would be about nine months time, for which you would feel that the migraine is, patient is migraine free. Question from Dr. Selvam: Tips to detect cervical spondylosis leading to similar symptoms. Okay, so actually, on cervicogenic vertigo. You know, sovagenic vertigo as, as a terminology came, was from the Germans, came in 1995. And then it, it has almost gone out of usage because primarily cervical spondylosis does not produce vertigo. But what it can produce is a feeling of dizziness. Why? A simple reason. The problem is anybody above 50 will have cervical, above 40 even these days, will have cervical spondylosis. And if it develops a vertigo, BPPV for example, if he has an X-ray, he has a cervical spondylosis. You can call this spondylogenic vertigo or cervical vertigo. The point here is to note that the symptoms, as I said about the timing and triggers approach. And if somebody has dizziness, how can a cervical spine produce problem? If you have a severe stiffness because of spondylosis, you can't move your neck adequately. There is restriction of movement, right? So normally, it's all in synchronous. Your eye movement, your head movement, your neck movement. And then the sense of orientation is all very synchronous. Suppose there is something happening on my right side. And then I want to look there. My eyes go there, but my neck can't go there. Then what happens? There is a slight disparity. So you can feel a little dizzy, but it doesn't cause vertigo. It's not vertigo per se. A mild dizziness that can happen. So, But it is usually a uh, very, very, very rare cause of a very mild symptom. There are a lot of uh, snags and many other type of physiotherapy that happens, but uh, has been used. But we generally say it is a very uncommon cause of vertigo, vertigo or similar uh, symptoms. Another question from Dr. Vamsi Krishna. Yeah. Uh, only when migraine comes, they have to take the medicine or is it a course of medicines? If you put the patient on prophylaxis, it has to be taken continuously for up to nine months time. Sometimes they may do well up to six months and disappear. You know, our patients generally, if you put a patient on, on a drug prophylaxis and say come back after three months, they would say, I was, I'm already stopped the drug and then two years later they come back to you and they say, sir, I was already, it's a brilliant treatment you gave, but uh, you never complete the course. The next time again, you write, I, I, I have patients who come like that regularly. Once in two years, they will come, take only for one month, 15 days sometimes and forget. But then sometimes we need to be very careful about what we're dealing with. But it is a course in that sense, yes. The prophylaxis. Dr. Soundappan, can carotid body tumor cause dizziness? Carotid body tumor, depending upon where it is placed, it can definitely cause feeling of dizziness, doesn't really cause vertigo. If you're talking about vertigo, when it doesn't, it's a rare cause, but it usually is associated with cranial nerve involvement and you would make a diagnosis. Dr. Shanti, role of vestibular ocular exercises. Very, very useful if properly done. So it's very important that they start off the vestibular rehabilitation therapy, as it is called. Uh, those simple exercises that they can start off with. I generally teach them the simple exercise, but then I tell them that you start moving around well. Then whatever normal is, so if you're not going to look up, look down all the time, which most of us don't look up, if you realize, we rarely ever look up. And so it is something that if you're comfortable, whatever, if you know in your normal activities, if something is disabling you, we look at what it is. But you continue to do all your normal activities, that is the best thing for developing your balance. 
Uh, that's the list of questions, Dr. Meenat Sundaram. Thank you very much. Very informative. Thank you. We will now move on to the third speaker.